Coming up next on Twitch, this week in computer hardware, the PS4, the next-gen Xbox, and Nintendo, they all agree they're going with AMD. APU overclocking, light squared versus GPS, PC power consumption, myths, 3 terabyte hard drive health, and what about the Hackintosh, anyway? It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 127, recorded July 7th, 2011. Sony, Microsoft, and Nintendo agree on AMD. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All stream directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, joined, as always, by the man, the myth, the benchmarking legend, who is home in his reasonably priced state of Kentucky. <laughs> very reasonably priced, very reasonably priced. Uh, next week, I might not be in as nearly a reasonably priced area, Portland. <laughs> Portland's um, pretty but, reasonably priced. Okay, well, then there you go. But I will, I will be out of town, but I, I will still be able to record the show. I don't think we're going to have any problems there. There uh, is so much good food in Portland. Sorry, I, I get distracted because we were... I like Portland. I like Portland. Portland, uh, Austin, San Francisco I like too, but then that whole cheap to living thing is not going to work out for me. So... <laughs> I like the, the the truck, the the food trucks in Portland. They make me yes. Very, they're they're very all good. over the place there. Yeah, you have to go to Kenny and Zooks, by the way, while you're there. Underneath I'll the Ace Hotel, Kenny and Zooks have the pastrami. You'll thank me. <laughs> okay. This is a hardware podcast. Uh, we talk about computer hardware and occasionally tablets and some of the bigger issues impacting your ability to use that stuff. But we're all about the chips, which brings us to the AMD A Series APU overclocking and gaming performance guide. What's going on with the A Series APUs, man? So we, we we went through the whole Lano desktop processor last week. We talked mm -hmm. about where it was good and where it wasn't. Not very good on CPU performance. Really good on GPU performance in terms of integrated graphics and that type of thing. Um, so we had we had some questions and, and people asking, and I was curious in my own right, really, how uh, we overclocking affected performance on this integrated graphics. Um, we we did talk last week about how memory performance affected graphics, and it could you know if you went from uh, DDR thirteen thirty three memory to sixteen hundred, you would oftentimes see an eight to ten percent gain in performance, and th that type of thing. So. Overclocking in Lano, just as, as a brief overview, there's, there's a base clock, kind of like you see in the Sandy Bridge processors and, and the Halem before that. There's a base clock that more or less affects everything else on the motherboard and in the system. Uh, on the Lano APUs, it is 100 megahertz stock. So as you increase that, your memory clock speed increases, your CPU clock speed increases, your GPU clock speed increases, the North Bridge clock speed increases, and thus your PCI Express and those types of things all increase in tandem with this. There is some multiplier control. Right now, uh, I think in the two motherboards I've looked at, Gigabyte and ASRock, the only multiplier I found is for the CPU clock. So you can bring that down. You can't take it over, right? So on the A83850, it's 29x is your default. 100 so you, times you 29 can, is 2.9 gig. You can decelerate it for what, power savings? So, no, what you do is if you overclock the base clock, mm -hmm. say, uh, which we did in, ah. in this video, we overclocked it from 100 to 133 megahertz, which uh, is a big difference, right? So that would take it to, I don't know what 133 times 29 is, but it's more than the processor could take with the cooling and the voltage I wanted to apply to it. So you can downclock uh, the, the, the uh, CPU multiplier, which we did to, I think, 27. Mm -hmm and settled it into a 3.6 gigahertz clock speed. So still a, a nice boost, 700 right. megahertz CPU frequency. But what I think is more important is that the GPU frequency goes from 600 to 800, Ooh. and the memory clock went up to 1720 or something like 1722, uh, I believe. Those are nice numerical gains, but in terms yeah. of benchmarkable performance work increase, what what did you guys see? Because it's always kind of funny, like sometimes you'll do something where you're like, I've got it, you know, it's 25% overclocked and you're like, and it's like 4% faster on the benchmarks. 
Right. Well, in this case, it actually turns out to be like pretty close to one to one. So uh, 800 megahertz versus 600 megahertz is a 33% increase in your GPU clock rate. Well, uh, if we looked at, we looked at 3D Mark 11, Bad Company 2, Lost Planet 2, Left 4 Dead 2, Dirt 3, uh, 1680 by 1050, medium quality settings, you know, obviously depends based on your game. And we saw results in that 29 to 32% actual performance increases, actual frame rate increases um, that I think were very impressive in terms of, you know, like you're saying, a lot of times you overclock and you don't really get the gains that you would think you would get out of that. In this instance, you actually did. Um, so it, in that respect, it was great overclocking potential. Now, ad admittedly, this is not going to make your Lano APU a you know, a $200 video card or a $150 video card or anything like that. It's, it's not going to overclock it that much. It's not going to improve performance that much. Right. But if, you, if you're going to buy a system and you are comfortable with overclocking anyway, to me, based on these results, and the overclocking was pretty simple, you know, go in there, change a couple settings. We increased the memory voltage just a little bit. Uh, and I think we increased the CPU voltage just a little bit, maybe, you know, a tenth or two tenths. No, not even that much. Maybe one tenth of a volt. Um, <laughs> And didn't have any problems with overheating at all. We're using a, an old heat sink. It's so old that it has the Enforce brand on it. Wow. NVIDIA Enforce brand on it. Um, but, you know, if you're building one of these systems for yourself, for budget gaming, uh, or even for your, your mom or dad, and you're just like, well, it's free performance. We might as, well, might as well give it to them for whatever games they're going to play. These are easily realized. So it, it, it's kind of cool. It was, it was cool to see these changes just kind of happen. And again, it's a combination of, we had, we had a faster cl uh, CPU clock, GPU clock, and memory clock kind of all working there. So um, it, it's not going to save the APU in terms of CPU performance. Right. But it gives you, it, it's another thing to play with. If Should you find yourself in possession of one and you want to boost it a little bit. Right. Um, right. And, and you know, if, like I'm saying, the, the bad, bad company two performance, we went from 28 to 37, which you know, maybe in the real world gaming environment, what you'd want to actually do is lower those quality settings a little right. bit. So you maybe get closer to 40 or 50 either way. Um, but I still think you're going to see the same 25 to 30% performance increase because if your GPU is your bottleneck, more shader power is going to improve performance. So, you know, going from eight, 600 to 800 megahertz, you are going to get those gains out of it. Uh, you know, that's one of the benefits of GPU technology. It scales very well with with uh, clock speed. So if you can get it, then I think, I think it's, I think it's worth trying, I guess is what I'm saying. Even if it's a good hack. I mean, if you, if you have the chip, it's definitely worth tweaking it around to see what you get in terms of performance. I, it's also really interesting because kind of uh, looking at a completely different issue is, is uh, the Hondo. You guys got some slides that were released from an AMD presentation mm -hmm. and I, I, if I'm, it, it's the title says it's a two watt TDP Brazos chip for tablets and Apache servers. It looks like it's like a one to four watt part, or it's like four watts for the APU, one watt for the GPU, and maybe playing 720p video with like a one watt power consumption. Yeah, exactly. I mean that this is it's not a new architecture. It is more mm -hmm. of a refinement of the Brazos architecture that's already out there. It's called right. Brazos T. Um, uh, otherwise known as Hondo. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a 40 nanometer process chip, same as Brazos as we see today, but the GPU is running at 276 megahertz. Things are clocked down a little bit. Um, I think one gigahertz on the CPU clock. So y you're getting this very low power, two watt part, uh, still not small enough for cell phones. And I think even at two watts, they need to be a little bit under that to be very competitive with the ARM architecture uh, in, the, in the tablet market. But what I was kind of curious through this announcement and news post, they didn't really say exactly when it was going to be released. They just have a 2012 date on there. Intel has been working very hard to try to get into this same market. And the Atom architecture has had trouble scaling up in performance. And Sandy Bridge has not been able to scale down. We talked a couple of months ago about Ivy Bridge and, and Intel's kind of stance where they were, what they were going to do from this point forward was they're going to do Ivy Bridge and all architectures everywhere, right? So they were going to bring this super ultra low voltage version derivative of Ivy Bridge down to these tablet type form factors. Uh, but I don't think those are 2012 product. Uh, I think it would be pretty 
tight if they were going to be able to do that. So I wonder, like my, my kind of curiosity about this Hondo architecture is, has AMD been able to catch up with the development Intel has done mm -hmm. this quickly? Um, because, you know, they didn't have really any plans for the tablet market as, as early as a year ago. Um, but maybe some of this work they did with the, you know, the, the Bobcat CPU architecture that is used in, uh, used in Brazos, used right. in the E-series parts, but only there, right? This is not an Athlon architecture kind of brought down. It's a completely new CPU architecture built for low power. Uh, and they may have been able to kind of leapfrog Intel in that regard. I don't know if they'll still be... I don't know. If, I don't think either company, honestly, is going to be good enough to overtake the ARM designs in 2012 for for what we've seen going forward into 2012. But it, it's interesting to see AMD uh, maybe making a name for itself in a market that nobody had them pegged to even compete in, let alone right. be one of the potential winners. And it's so funny because, you know, we've talked about it before, we'll say it again, you know, mobile parts are kind of the future for the industry, at least in terms of the big, large scale, low cost processors that go everywhere. So there's definitely, everybody wants a piece of that. Uh, I, I think NVIDIA the most, <laughs> but, right. but AMD and Intel certainly uh, want to have, they want to at least keep pace with, if not outright crush uh, arm if at all possible um next generation consoles a lot of rumors coming out of e3 um and you guys uh you were talking about uh, hard ocp's write up on that and it's interesting yep. um the big winner is amd who will be providing the graphical power for all three of the next generation of major consoles as well as being in the running for putting a bulldozer apu inside of sony's next game system IBM is the other competitor for providing Nintendo's core with an updated cell processor, which will also be running in the next generation Xbox. Nintendo is also going with IBM, although they are looking at a custom-built 45 nanometer CPU. This is very good news for AMD with a guaranteed presence in every console and a possible hardware monopoly with Sony. So let me see if I get this right. AMD is going to be powering all of the next generation consoles. Xbox is moving away from its Intel-ish architecture for a cell processor. Uh, Nintendo is probably going to make a custom processor, but still use AMD graphics. How did AMD end up scoring the big win across the console platforms? It's it's interesting. <laughs> or, or is this all still rumored at this point? I mean, it, it is all still rumored. From what I've heard, this is probably pretty accurate. So it's interesting here. So... It, Nintendo already announced their system. We already knew that that was, right. that was powered by AMD GPU and an IBM processor. Keep in mind, the Xbox 360 does have an IBM processor as well. It's just not a cell processor. It's uh, their three-core dual-threaded, so six-thread IBM uh, design in there. And then it had an ATI graphics card in there. So that's kind of almost remaining the same. It'll be an AMD architecture for the GPU. Um, and then according to you know, Kyle's story over here at IBM, cell processor or IBM processor of some kind. Um, you know, the, these companies, these console companies, you know, if we'd asked this a year ago, maybe they were going to use NVIDIA parts. But because the consoles have been delayed, they're, they're going by what is going to be the best technology down the road. They're looking at performance as well as power consumption. Nobody wants a red ring of death issue coming up in the next generation of consoles. They don't. I think we'll find that the, that the console companies are less likely to use super advanced processes and super advanced GPUs the, that might potentially have problems if we look at, again, the, the Xbox issue and uh, even the, the issue with NVIDIA GPUs on notebooks like uh, the MacBooks and these other right. machines during the 8000 series. That, that's an issue that console manufacturers can't afford anymore, and they're not going to, going to risk that. And so maybe AMD says, hey, look at our track record. We haven't done any of that stuff with uh, GPUs, and that's where they're going with. Um, mm -hmm. they, I mean, they, AMD has a very compelling GPU product, both in the mobile right. and the desktop fronts today. And, you know, if the consoles come out, uh, if we say the consoles are announced next year, they're going to be using technologies um, that will probably be announced or discussed later this right. year. So, so, I mean, we, they pretty much have all the information they're going to have from <laughs> NVIDIA and AMD when they're bidding for all this stuff. So, uh, it's interesting. I think the most interesting thing is the fact that Sony might be using an APU that's like a bulldozer derivative integrated, you know, like the next generation of Lano that we've just been talking about earlier parts uh, of this very show and last week could be inside the next Sony PlayStation, PlayStation 4, whatever it is. And, and, and it's a compelling product. 
especially considering that the next generation is going to have a faster GPU, right. it's going to have a faster CPU. Well, does that mean they're walking away from the cell architecture altogether? Because, you know what I mean, they, they spent all that time moving, you know, the first generation of, of PS3 games were eminently playable, but not particularly great aesthetically. It took like a, a year for, for PS3 programmers right. to get up to speed to how to make the cell processor jump through hoops to do pretty graphics. They've invested all this time in developing um, you know, software, basically learning how to develop better software on the cell architecture, and then all of a sudden, like, right turn, or in this case, left turn in the studio, you know, they're, they're going back <laughs> to a traditional APU, while Nintendo, of all people, seems to be picking up a cell processor architecture, and it's just, you know, it's enough to make you twitch a little bit, no pun intended. If this... If this is true, then yes, they would be walking away completely from the right. cell architecture, and I don't necessarily think that would be a bad thing. Even up to this point in the console generation wars, everybody considers the PlayStation 3 the most difficult platform to design for, right. and that's why. Uh, if they were able to go with an x86-based design, with a traditional GPU-based design, mm -hmm. uh, then I would imagine you'd see more games faster. Would they be sacrificing some maybe potential uh, maximum performance, theoretical performance levels? Maybe. But it doesn't really matter if it takes three or four years for people to figure out how to program on your machine. I mean, that's one of the reasons I think the Xbox 360 has been successful it has this generation is because it is much more simple to code and design for. That makes sense. Plus, I would imagine developers would like to be you know, able to create PC and console versions with a minimum of suffering across the two. Speaking yeah, exactly. of which, uh, oops, sorry. I was going to say, exactly, and that's good for PC gamers down the line, too, is if right. more people uh, are basing this off x86 architecture and standard, you know, discrete level class mm -hmm. GPUs, then that's better for PC gamers down the road, too. Easier conversions and easier uh, upscaling of, of content and that kind of stuff would probably be in order there. <laughs> more games that suck less is a win. Yes. Lano is on sale now. You... That's it. That's all we needed to say. <laughs> Nine Nights, by the way, if you've ever used it, not to take anything away from Lano. Uh, Nine Nights is pretty cool. That allows you for supported applications to integrate the installation of those applications into your Windows install. They now have it set up so they can update all of the applications it supports. So if you are a fan of Nine Night and you haven't checked it out recently, go check out Nine Night. Again, it is an awesome application, especially if you like to build and play around with systems constantly. And uh, they also have a pro version, which is pretty slick if you're doing um, large amounts of software management across multiple machines. Um, they basically say it's faster than the regular one and does some really, really smart stuff in terms of integrating the installations. Um, and yeah, I like the I like the fact that they've got the updater. You will have to. I think you do have to pay money, but I'm just starting to play around with it on my system at home because you know mm -hmm. uh, there's nothing that makes me happier than a chance to rebuild my system from the ground up. Um, <laughs> Which is a sign that I am deeply, deeply damaged at some core yes. level. But if you've never seen it, nightnight.com uh, is the website. And you basically you pick the applications you want to install, web browsers, messaging, media, runtime, uh, imaging, including my beloved paint.net, which is the coolest free photo editing application ever, with all due respect to the GIMP. Uh, although the GIMP is cooler because it's open source, and everybody knows open source is cooler than everything. Um, <laughs> I don't think Paint.net is uh, open source. Uh, I don't know if it's open source. It's definitely free, but it's definitely awesome. <laughs> so the, the updater it's saying is nine ninety nine. Yeah. Um, it's it still sounds pretty compelling to me. You know, no websites to visit, no downloads to manage. Uh, it automatically checks for it. Um, that that's pretty good. And I've used the nine. We used it. We rebuild. It seems like we rebuild our video editing machine every week. <laughs> and without that, it would be a much more painful process uh, than it is. I only wish Nine Night supported Adobe CS5 installations. <laughs> but that might be a little bit much. <laughs> yeah, the the user base on that's probably not as broad as they would like. Um, yeah. Have you have you been looking at what's been going on with like Light Squared in the last week or two? Can't say I have. So Light Squared, they got a bunch of news this week, and, I'm, and we were talking about them on Techzilla. Um, Cause they got like two hundred seventy million dollars in funding, or an additional two hundred sixty-five million, or something like that. And their plan, uh, and and depending on who you're asking, this should either be said with a you know sort of liberating the people kind of happy flag waving thing, or petting a white cat in your lap like Doctor Evil, is that they're going to create a net neutral nationwide four G network with forty thousand base stations plus satellite to fill in sort of the empty spaces. Basically, they have a huge amount of of um, spectrum that was originally set aside for satellites. The FCC 
And the reason I bring this up is basically they're talking about they, they want to create a nationwide wireless network where you're not dealing with, you know, the, the wind of suck that, that is perhaps not that I'm bitter about Verizon getting rid of their unlimited accounts on phones, your grandfathered or grandmothered in if you already have a an unlimited uh, yeah. uh, account on Verizon. But basically they're claiming like net neutrality, they're going to be awesome, they're going to be cool, they're going to do this ginormous 139 markets, which is like pretty much the majority of the population of the United States. States um, for coverage. The FCC is withholding authorization on their bandwidth because, amongst other people, uh, the Departments of Defense and Transportation um, are claiming it creates serious problems with uh, GPS signals. So, because mm-hmm. um, uh, Light Squared is looking to use basically uh, put a terrestrial service on the 1525 to 1559 megahertz bandwidth, which gets really interesting because you start looking at this and they're saying Light Squared signals would significantly interfere with GPS users and as a result impact national security, economic security, and public safety nationwide. I pulled that quote out of uh, America, Ameriserve.com, which is like a surveyor's website. Um, you know the the avweb.com which is an aviation website um it's a news site for people who, who are uh, uh flight buffs basically are saying that uh, you know they they remark that the 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 u.s is out of radio frequency the the spectrum is pretty much all allotted uh, even though hmm. uh, fcc chairman Janichowski has promised 500 megahertz to create the national broadband plan um light square is just trying to use a mere 20 megahertz which is a pretty tiny chunk of spectrum uh and you know it's kind of funny so this is back and forth between uh, SaveOurGPS.org, the Coalition to Save GPS, which includes FedEx, UPS, Trimble, <laughs> Garmin, the Air Transport Association, Delta, um, American Airlines. I don't know who all else at this point. Um, and, and basically, they're saying GPS, you know, signal interference could jeopardize America's safety. Light squared, they've got, like, say they have interference sorted for 99% of the potential users. Um, so the end result is, hmm. is that... Once again, you know, uh, an attempt to bring broadband nationally is turning into a giant political mess <laughs> or a giant. I mean, it's crazy. The Canadian Space Authority, the Canadian Owners and Pilots Association, Case New Holland, Caterpillar, Deer and Company, which, yes, is the tractor company, um, Edison Electric Institute, uh, <laughs> the Equip to Survive Foundation, which it's kind of funny. If you want to see a really interesting group of places, check out SaveOurGPS.org. The Farm Equipment Manufacturers Association, which I like to think <laughs> of as the other FEMA. Uh, the Fire Department of New York. Um, it's in a pretty insane. The, the General Aviation Manufacturers Association. The list, as they say goes on so chances are that that uh, there is no chance in hell that light squared is going to get to roll their network out unless they find alternative spectrum um, because this is a pretty this is a yeah pretty insane group you can if, you, if you've got the video you can see it the American Car Rental Association the American <laughs> Petroleum Institute the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials um, you know Magellan GPS Machine Control Online Leica Geosystems Omnistar Orienteering USA PocketGPSWorld.com I mean like TomTom Tom, you know it's it's uh, the USA Rice Federation, and then you get into the associate nice. members. And there's like another four million of those. So, you know, I I think the only pro- group that can possibly now bring wireless uh, uh, internet nationwide and provide uh, competition for local DSL or cable is is probably going to end up being Google. Uh, the way things are going, but you're going to save us from everybody from everything. Well, you know, I I would I would I would very much like to see Light Square succeed. I I also would very much like the you know, and the estimates are as high as 500 million GPS devices currently in use in the United States still function uh, <laughs> for anyone who yeah. perhaps wanted to use them. So. Now, we have one more bit before we get to our emails and such. You said there was a public service announcement we needed to address, hands-free, not safer on the highway or no safer on the highway. <laughs> so, uh, PCMag.com. Yeah, the Governor's Highway Safety Association combed through a decade's worth of statistics and research papers about the causes of car crashes, says Sarah Yun over at PCMag.com, and found that cell phone-related distractions accounted for 15 to 25% of crashes. The figure is likely even higher since law enforcers do not catch every driver using his or her cell phone before an accident. Uh, so, the, basically, the group is saying no one should be using a cell phone hands-free or not, at least for novice uh, high-risk drivers. Sure. 
So, quote, novices are the highest risk drivers. Their attention should be focused on driving, not on cell phone conversations or other distractions. So, um, it's kind of funny. I think we can agree with that. Yeah. The group also says they have not found conclusive as the evidence suggesting that a cell phone ban for novice drivers already enacted in 30 states has actually prevented any car crashes. <laughs> so we don't know if it's better or worse. Well, it could the, be worse. The, 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 the insurance Institute hub for highway safety found no reduction in car crashes, even after handheld cell phones were banned in California, Connecticut, New York, and Washington, DC. Mm. So. That's because everybody's got to hold them down below steering wheel level to text now because you're not allowed to actually hold up. <laughs> That's just a transfer of distraction. Wait, let, let me see if the uh, if the uh, the international uh, the international institute for highway safety article quotes uh, anything about texting. But we would like. I think I can safely say on behalf. Oh, yeah, ban phoning and or texting while driving. Finds no reductions in crashes after handheld phone bans take effect. Yeah. There you All right. Well, go. before we jump into our emails for this week, we'll take a quick break here and thank today's podcast sponsor, Netflix. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, which means you get to save time, money, and hassle. All three of which I am. Uh, well, I guess I was going to say all three of which I'm glad to get rid of, but I'm not glad to get rid of time or money, just the hassle part. <clears throat> there are uh, several ways to instantly access streaming movies and TV shows with Netflix. First, you can watch Netflix movies and TV shows on your Mac, PC, or iPad with the new iPad app. Two, you can watch the uh, you can watch them on your iPhone and some Android phones. I know my HTC Evo does support that, and I think actually quite a few of them do now. Third, if you have a gaming console like an Xbox 360, PlayStation 3, Nintendo Wii, you can watch Netflix right on your TV that way. Or finally, even if you're not a gamer, you can watch Netflix on your TV with an Apple TV or a Roku box. Uh, they're inexpensive and also pretty easy to use. Uh, with mm -hmm. Netflix, you can watch movies and TV shows instantly using any of those devices, and you can begin watching a movie uh, or show on one device and then finish in it or finish it on a different one. Whichever way you choose to access Netflix, you can watch as many movies and as TV shows as you want anytime. Try Netflix today for 30 days free. Go to netflix.com slash twits. It's just that easy. Be sure to use that URL when you sign up for the free trial. It gives all of us here at This Week in Tech and our, our network credit, netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware, and we hope you enjoy watching instantly with Ooh. Netflix. Thank you, Netflix. Netflix rocks. It does. Christian's got a question about Ifinity and primary displays. He says, I'm looking to build a new system. I'm toying with the idea of three displays attached to a Radeon 6950. I currently use two HP 19-inch displays on an NVIDIA GeForce 7300 LE. I've also been stuck on XP all this time, he adds. Leaving out the practicality of expanding my displays to the entire width of my desk, I have obviously not played with recent hardware in a while, and I don't really understand whether there is a relationship between output types and my primary monitor. If I'm using a display port and two DVI outputs, does the display port get preference over the others in some way? Which display would get full screen video and show the post does ifinity let me t make that determination supposing my third screen is a 24 inch widescreen at an obviously different resolution am i facing potential aspect ratio problems depending on which display gets the output i realize it's old but as an easy example diablo 2 on a widescreen display looks like total crap Secondly, you sometimes talk about 30-inch displays, but is there anything out there you could recommend in a more modest 24-inch size with a decent resolution and not a ridiculous amount of money? Well, uh, there is 1920 by 1080 uh, in up to a 24-inch monitor yep. at a reasonable price. And then there is 27 and 30-inch monitors, which cost... You can basically buy three 22, 23, 24-inch monitors for the price of a single 30-inch monitor these days. So yep. your affordable alternative to a single massive 2560 by you know 1480, uh, 2560 by 1600 30-inch uh, flat panel is basically multiple 21, 22, 24-inch flat panels. Right, um, which I would st I would still probably recommend for most majority of users. Yeah. Uh, the the other parts. So he currently has two HP nineteen inch displays, and if he's going to add a third one of twenty four, the the complication there is if you have two nineteens and a twenty four, you are and they're going to be at different resolutions. You're not going to be able to use affinity in the uh, aspect that you're thinking about one big screen. Right that you can run games across. Now you can have, you know, for 2D applications, Windows, desktop, all that kind of stuff, you can obviously just set them up as multiple displays and use them that way. That's not an issue. 
But in order to game across three displays, they'll have to be the same. They don't have to be the exact same monitor, but they have to be the same resolution at least. So uh, keep that in mind if you're going to purchase a, a third display. <laughs> uh, and then the, oops, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna, does iFinity allow you? I, I, I've, I haven't played around with an iFinity monitor setup. I'm assuming it allows you to pretty much place any monitor in any position in terms of what's going on with, with the main resolutions and stuff like that, or positioning the monitors. Yeah, yeah. One, you can. I mean, you can plug the monitors in as the last thing you do, and in, in the mm -hmm. configuration for Ifinity, it will guide you through the process of making sure that the computer knows what order they're in to display the images in the correct way. Right. So ordering not necessarily important in there, uh, and then you can choose if you want to do all portrait or all landscape in that regard as well. Uh, his issue about post. Um, which display we get full screen video and show the post? I I honestly have no idea, and it's it's. It's something I've never been able to figure out which of the two DVI ports <laughs> right. or the HDMI or display port is actually going to show uh, the post screens. I'm trying to think in our video editing rig, we have a DVI and a display port connection in use on a Quadro graphics card, and the DVI port gets the post screen there. Um, I believe it just has to, to, it just depends on what order those outputs are configured, say, in the graphics card BIOS themselves and but no you won't be able to configure that in software um not in anything i've ever been able to see so and in terms of uh you know finding uh more modest 24 inch sizes with, with decent resolution let me say it again uh 1920 by 1200 is considered you know it's pretty rare these days some of the more high-end professional monitors have it 1920 by 1080 you basically, your your basic HD, uh, full HD television resolution is where most 21, 24 inch monitors are going to be at. I still like the Dell Outlet is a great place to find monitors mm -hmm. on the cheap, the the refurbished uh, monitors. Um, you know, so you're looking at like a 23 inch widescreen flat panel monitor LED backlit. That's 170 bucks there. Um, that's 1920 by 1080. Um, 349 for a full HD 3D monitor, uh, 24 inch ultra sharp, which are always a little pricier, selling for 399. For something a little more, uh, you know, less expensive, you know, 19, 21 inch monitors are selling for 130 bucks. And you know, I also say uh, Samsung does a pretty good job on mm -hmm. on flat panel monitors for computers and. Somehow I managed to close the window I had open on Newegg.com. Uh, Somebody in the chat room just pointed out that they saw an Apple 27-inch monitor uh, for 750 wow. uh, as a refurb this week. That's a pretty good deal. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good deal, but the, you know, still a little. Yeah. I mean, you're still, if you're looking at a 30-inch monitor, you're looking spending around $1,000. Um, yeah. Wow, 19-inch 90, 19-inch uh, hands G monitors for 90 bucks. 19 <laughs> inches is kind of dead to me. Um. <laughs> I would agree with that. I think 22 is kind of a minimum monitor right. size these days. Probably 24 would be the, the smallest I'd go with. I mean, but I'm coming from a different perspective. I'm somebody who's used almost exclusively 30 inch monitors for four years. Um, so I realize I'm, I'm not your average consumer there. Ooh. But the Samsung BX2331, which is a 23 inch full LED, HD LED. Uh, that's selling for 200 bucks new uh, on Newegg. Acer's, they're listing an Acer 32-inch flat panel HD TV for 309, 24-inch Asus for 200, handsfree. There's a yeah, it's 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 a good time to be buying nice monitors. Indeed. Ooh, 329 for a 27-inch Samsung, but it's 1920 by 1080, and those pixels are going to look awful big if it's. They're going to be very large pixels, face. indeed. <laughs> Great big pixels. Let's see, we got an email in uh, from Marco asking about Hackintosh stuff. He says he's an avid Windows PC builder, but lately I've been having the itch to test out the Mac OS as a side project. I've been reading a lot about building a Hackintosh and have a fairly good idea on what it takes, but I've not been able to get the sense of how hard it is to get the OS on a home build and how often Mac updates kill the system. Have you ever tried building a Hackintosh? Is it worth the trouble? I like that a Windows PC build seems to just work, as Steve Jobs likes to say, so I'm kind of hoping that with the right parts, a Mac build can do the same. Um, I have built a Hackintosh, not super recently, I want to say at least a year ago, and um, the secret that I knew of was to go to some of the, the, the forums that you're probably already reading up on, Marco, about this technology. Find somebody that has a very specific hardware configuration mm -hmm. that they have confirmed works 100% and copy it completely. 
uh, and then, any kind of, and then don't update your OS. <laughs> yeah, never. When it pops up the little updates, always say no, thank you, because that will inevitably break something. The, the it wasn't so it wasn't too hard to do. I'm trying to remember when I built mine. I believe it was an Halem base, and it it was any P67. No, that's too recent. Um, maybe it was any P67 motherboard. No, I can't remember exactly what it was, but you had to pick a very specific chipset. Right. Uh, that that basically that Apple, if you can as closely mirror the hardware that Apple has built into their iMac or Mac Pro right. machines, that's going to give you your best chance. Um, I haven't built one recently enough to talk about how Sandy Bridge works on it, mm -hmm. but I would assume the same thing applies. You know, the the Sandy Bridge chipsets. If we go with a a P67 and a, and a Sandy Bridge, like a you know any Sandy Bridge that you can buy, essentially, I would imagine it would work. The complications come in play when you pick out your graphics card because you have to have right. one that's going to be supported by Mac OS. So that's going to be very specific. And then I don't know RAID configurations don't count on that working necessarily. You plan on using a single drive SSD or hard drive or whatever it is, but I. I don't know what you would recommend, Patrick, but I would always recommend going to those forums, doing a lot of research, and more or less just copying what somebody else has already spent the time doing. Absolutely. Uh, OSX86project.org is kind yep. of the, the, the ground central for, uh, ground central station for uh, Hackintosh's uh, insanely Mac um, would be, uh, uh, another form to check out. Um, you know, it's, 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 uh, hackintosh.org would be another one to check out. Um, it's 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 something you know everybody's like yeah i'm gonna get like a tower for cheap and it's like you're gonna pay less money but you're probably gonna spend time configuring this and maintaining it um yeah. you know I, uh, apple effectively figured out a way to recognize atom cpus refused to run uh you know os 10 on it after a certain build date simply because they wanted to kill off the Hackintosh netbook market. They wanted it to go away. Apple has a lot of money and a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of time invested in controlling the experience and they don't want you to build your own machines. Unfortunately, since they use commodity hardware in the form of, you know, Intel processors and 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 co designed motherboards or I guess maybe they could be designing their own, but it's probably kind of they're going to share a lot of components with PCs. There's ways around mm -hmm. that, but they want to make it as difficult as possible. Um, so, yeah, if you want to do this, um, spend quality time at the OS X86 project and around the internets. And, you know, Ryan's got it on the head. Find out what's working, build it, and figure out a way to prevent your machine from updating, uh, <laughs> if at all possible. And, you know, understand that you need to back up everything on a, a drive you can access even if that machine goes down. Because um, there's nothing more painful than discovering, like, you can't finish your homework because your Hackintosh got snorfed by an update that you didn't, <laughs> you know, meant you didn't realize was going to go in there. Yeah. No one's got a question about GPU transcoding software. He says, I recently upgraded my graphics card to a Radeon 6950 with 2 gigs of RAM. I've also taken your advice and purchased a 60 gigabyte SSD, the Agility 2, as my Windows 7 64-bit drive, and I use an older Caviar 500 gigabyte drive for the main stuff. I love my system. I can see why. And it's not bleeding edge because I'm relatively cheap, but I've been thrilled with the performance changes compared to my aging Intel Core 2 Quad 8200. Excuse me. Uh, relatively... Uh, the performance changes for my aging Intel Core 2 Quad Q8200 uh, running at 2.8 <laughs> gigahertz with 8 gigabytes of RAM. That's, that's actually not a bad system. Nope. My question is this. I've ripped all of my old DVD collection with the exception of some that give me issues. <coughs> unmentionable name because I don't feel like being sued and I have a full disk of .vob files. I've been using Handbrake and the performance isn't really bad in converting these to various formats for my Android phones or iPod touches but with a shiny new GPU I wanted to see if there were any software packages that took advantage of the GPU exclusively or in part to do a better faster job Faster, yes. Better, debatable. We'll get into that in right. a minute. There isn't a lot of benchmarking data out there to compare GPU transcoding against each other do you read PCPer.com's GPU reviews, sir? <laughs> or against CPU results? I haven't had luck even after installing the Shark 007 codecs and setting them up using ATI's video converter. Is there a trick to getting that working with VOB files? Um, where do we start? There Handbrake's are a lot of GPU transcoding apps. Yeah. I mean, 
I mean, a VOB file is a container, right? It's kind of like a, mm-hmm. a, an MKV file. It's not an actual. It is. It is a. It is. It is. Man, my head's going to explode. It's a metaphor for your computer. It's a handle for your computer to know how to to deal with a collection of files inside of that container files. Um, you know, so VOB is is you know contains something uh, basically right. that, that that fits under the DVD video format file. Um, it's kind of funny, like you know, VOB files can't contain MPEG four video. They can't contain AAC audio, um, you know, which are standard MPEG encodes. But it's it's really frustrating, right? Because we're all like, our GPU can do this amazing stuff, and and you know, insert name of graphics card company comes around with a with a demo. The CUDA stuff supported more broadly. Um, you know, but it takes a lot of time to take advantage of all the unbelievably cool. Your phone was buzzing so happily earlier. What did you do? <laughs> nice. I love making him turn red because he turns the most epic shade. Um, so, you know, Handbrake, of course, being open source, it's encoded. Um, you know, it's... it's um, Man, I th- I want to. Th- I thought they were working on support for GPU acceleration, but just don't have it in place. I, I think they. I think they are, but it's it's not out yet. Um, right. Probably my favorite application that is compatible with NVIDIA GPUs, ATI, AMD mm-hmm. GPUs, and even the Intel Sandy Bridge uh, QuickSync technology is Cyberlink's Media Espresso. Yeah, it's 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 a very consumer friendly, supposed to be for your mom type of application Mm -hmm. or doesn't give you a ton of options up front and you can only tweak certain little things but when it works it works very well and it does take advantage of your of your gpu and it will work faster than uh your processor unless you have a sandy bridge that is something to keep in mind bada boom is also the most popular but that's for nvidia graphics cards and intel sandy bridge processors apparently according to the website i was just looking at it still does not support amd graphics cards is there anything going on with the vivo at this point it just seems uh, like a Vivo kind of happened, and uh, so the the ATI Vivo video transcoder mm-hmm. is not any good. Yeah, just it's awful. It, <laughs> it when it, when, it, when it first came out, it had lots of issues. It was creating right. artifacts and imaging and that kind of stuff. And I would never recommend using it. It's never been updated since. Oh, okay. So, so for some reason, I thought they were they had done something to update it. So if they've updated it so many school, I mean, it, it, let's put it this way: if they're not coming to me on a monthly basis telling me about how awesome the product is, then I have to believe that it's not because they do that even when they have somewhat awful, right. you know, pieces of software and uh, things like that. So I, I, I wouldn't trust it. I, Media Show Espresso is going to cost you uh, free trial, $40 if you want to buy it. Um, Does Media I think Espresso it's- handle VOB, VOB files? Bob, um, let me see. It will tell me. I think. I mean, uh, one of the things is is Handbrake does what it does really well, and, it I, does. and I know you want to take advantage of G, your your GPU, but the level of codec support and the level of granularity in your control over the output, and and the truth is, is like if you've got an iPod, freaking hit the iPod setting, hit the button, let it encode, and walk right. away. Don't don't you know unless you're really into getting your video nerd on and playing around with the transcoding settings. Um, but you know it's it's uh it's an open source project it's an amazing open source project but they'll kind of get to stuff when they get to stuff and it's it's a shame i could have sworn there was a, a pretty good uh uh forum posting talking about their relationship with with ATI and Nvidia and i can't find it at the moment um yes there, Media does... Espresso 6 and higher can import a VOB file and generate yep. an mpeg4 out of it uh, yep, 6.5 is the is the latest version out for that. That that's the that's the software we've used in some of our processor reviews and GPU reviews most recently. It's like I said, it's kind of built for your mom type of styliz- stylization. So if if you if you like to get down to right. the details of things, you're not going to be able to do it in this app. But if you're going to do what Patrick was recommending on Handbrake, which is pick a profile and go. This will be able to do that, and it and it has same things. It'll support you know output for my iPad or iPhone, mm-hmm. uh, the Google Nexus. It has you know the HTC HD two, and it, it'll it'll target specific phones as well as if you want to back it up just for storage on your computer. So right. I mean it has all these options in it, um, but it's a good. I'll always try it first, but then I think they they have that option too. So. 
So the short answer is check out Media Espresso. If it doesn't do what you like with the free trial version, don't buy it. Uh, and don't erase, don't, don't take handbrake off your system yet. <laughs> right. Yes, exactly. Matt emails, he's got a question about three terabyte drive compatibility. He says, love the show. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Matt. I am planning to move into a new apartment, and then I plan on changing my computer setup when I do to something a little more sophisticated. I'm a PC gamer with a love of downloading anime and TV shows. I did not hear that, la, 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 la. So I have quite a lot of data to house, and I keep my 7.5 terabytes of data on my gaming PC, and I thought it was time to decentralize. Good idea, young Jedi. I was thinking about getting four 3-terabyte hard disk drives and putting them inside of a RAID 5 and a Windows 7 X64 Pro and running it off of an SSD. Why not free NAS? I'm looking to get a Core i5 Sandy Bridge 2400 with 8 gigabytes of DDR3. Hopefully this is the gaming PC. PC. <laughs> GTX 560 with a gigabyte GAP 67X UD3 B3 MOBO. My plan for this computer is to run an FTP server, XBMC server, file server, Usenet client. That's a lot of CPU for a freaking file server. And a Mumble server all it running 24-7 and have the ability to game a little when landing. My question is, I know that some can, yeah, <laughs> don't, don't, don't serve while gaming, dude. You'll get fragged. I know that some computers have trouble seeing three terabyte drives, having only 2.3 terabytes show up. And I'm not sure what exactly I need to make sure my motherboard needs to have make this work. If you're interested in my gaming PC rig, I'm running a Core i7 Sandy Bridge 2700 with 16 gigs of RAM. Oh, well, no wonder Jeez. he's feeling about doing a little side gaming on the yeah. Core i5 server. With 16 gigs of RAM and overclocked GTX 4. 80 and running off of two Intel 510 series 6 gigabyte 120 gig drives in RAID 0. Really? And also to all Damn. you Twitch viewers that aren't on SSDs yet, just buy one. They are so fast. So fast he had to freaking RAID 0 them. Dude, Matt, you're a freak. Nice. I love you. Um, wow, yeah. <laughs> I think this is a typo. I don't think there's such a thing as a Core i7-2700 in a desktop right. form factor. There's a 2730QM for the mobile form factor. Chances are he meant 2600. That is the fastest Sandy Bridge on the desktop. But He's got a nice system. <laughs> it's no good. wonder he it's, wants a Core i5 good. server. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> The, and if he uh, wants a game on it, then that's fine. You know, yeah. I could see wanting to have at least a uh, you know a, a somewhat decent system. It is not optimal that. to to use to to use your gaming to basically serve stuff off of your gaming machine. Yeah, um, well, I was assuming he's the one who's taking stuff off the server. Right. Then if he's gaming, they won't be. I don't know, <laughs> but yes, I agree. Um, I, so I asked our resident storage es expert Alan Malventano about this mm -hmm. uh, about the the three terabyte issue. And he said, essentially, you need a UEFI BIOS if you want to boot from a two uh, from a three terabyte drives. Doesn't sound like he wants to do that. Um, that he's, it sounds like he wants to have an SSD and then use these as storage capability. Right. Uh, but you can do it if you have UEFI UEFI BIOS. Uh, you can't access it fully with most 32-bit operating systems, so you may have to make sure you have Windows 7 64-bit. Mm -hmm. So you can see all of the data. And uh, you can't access it in motherboard RAID without a compatible driver update, i.e. the latest version of Intel's RST rapid storage technology driver. So you'll be able to go in your BIOS. You'll be able to create an array. If you're going to install to that, you're going to have to hit the F6 trick to install the driver during Windows installation. Ooh. If you're not going to boot off of them, you don't have to worry about that. You can wait until your system is booted and you've got your, your Windows and your loading drivers. And when you load the latest revision of Intel's RST, according to Alan, you will be able to see it, you'll be able to access it, and you'll be in merry storage land, right? So, um, and it looks like based on your other hardware, you have the knowledge and capability to build a system that meets those requirements. It sounds like the only real requirement is UEFI, UEFI BIOS on your right. motherboard. And it's funny, like just trying to find a a UE. It's kind of funny, like there's no there's no like blankets. Well, actually, maybe on Newegg there's a blanket setting for UEFI, but I doubt I, it now. But that would be, I mean, I don't think that's that a good motherboard idea. he wants is is UEFI or is it? Uh, I don't believe so because I don't think yeah. Gigabyte has really implemented UEFI yet. Uh, the ASUS Sabertooth P67 does use it. ASRock uh, P67 Extreme Four right. does have UEFI BIOS. Um, I believe if you get the Intel branded P67 board, it also has a UEFI BIOS. Um, and Gigabyte might be rolling some of that out. I'm kind of looking mm -hmm. through here. Uh, looks like there is some Gigabyte 
P67 UD7 boards. That's their right. super high end offering. Well, you know um, what? I mean, ASRock does a 60 or excuse me, a $70. That's like ASRock's got a $70 uh, Eufy motherboard. MSI's, mm -hmm. uh, that's mm -hmm. a Z68. Uh, ASRock, uh, Deluxe 5 AM3 Plus, MD890. ASRock's really big into Eufy BIOS. I wonder if that means they're going to be right. really big in the Hackintosh scene. Um, Could be. Looks like now, again, that only matters if you're going to boot off the three terabyte right. drives. If, you, if, you, if you're comfortable and knowing you're not going to be able to boot off of them, then it, you can pick whatever board you want uh, and as long as you go with the 64-bit operating system mm -hmm. and then that most recent driver. So, I will say ASRock has a really nice three terabyte unlocker web page. <laughs> yeah, Gigabyte has one. Uh, Gigabyte has a different one. No, that's that's you're right. That's a different that's a different thing. Yeah, it is Asrock that has. I think Asus might have that too. They are kind of brother and sister companies, um, but does the same type of thing. I think that was right. a software necessary before the latest revision of the Intel RST. Yeah, basically so they that's a need that more. bridging software that lets you run the uh, run the three terabyte drives natively in a bunch of their machines. So yeah, I mean three. You know, by this time next year, I'm sure we'll be dealing with four terabyte drives, and three terabytes will be old hat. Let's hope so. Actually, I'm hoping for six terabytes, but I'm greedy. <laughs> Andrew's got a question about GPU idle power consumption. He says, after struggling with my PC and AMD Athlon XT 4200, two gigs of RAM on board graphics, and not being able to play games for a long time now, I feel mm -hmm. it is time for a new rig, and you're gonna love it, dude, because it's gonna feel so fast, even if you don't spend a lot of money. I've already decided that it's gonna be an Intel i7 or i5 probably an i5 with a solid state drive 68 gigs of ram but i'm struggling with the gpu the graphics card here's my issue i want to play games like portal 2 and shogun 2 but i don't get much time to play them and i leave my pc on most of the time as it acts as a small server i'm a software developer so i also plan to have a separate drive to run a hackintosh on as well as good old ubuntu 2 windows 7 will be my main operating system though if that affects anything I can't seem to find the answer to this question. If Windows powers off the display, does it shut down the graphics card, meaning it draws little or no power? I know some cards will idle at somewhere between 20 and 50 watts, but does the PC ever shut down the GPU? With that in mind, do I buy a high-end graphics card or something mid-range and make it do or make do with it? Money is not really an object, but I don't like wasting it. Um, you know... I run a lot of biodiesel through my truck. I buy food locally. I try to keep, you know, caustic, you know, some of the more frightening sure. chemicals out of the house. I, I may not be a tree hugger, but I, I have certain leanings that are tree huggery. Um, <laughs> but I can do the math on electricity. And right. I am all for not pissing away money to the electrical utilities because, you know, here in California, they tend to blow up communities. I'm kidding for anybody out there who works for PG&E. Um, <laughs> In, in, in a really obnoxious way, but the uh, um, calculate the amount of electricity, P figure out what you're paying per kilowatt, right? You know, does it vary during the day? Do you play a flat rate? You know, do you have a, a sliding tier of payments depending on whether it's between business hours or overnight? And really take a look at what 100 watts, a single light bulb is costing you on an annual basis, because that's pretty much what your PC is going to be using at idle on the outside these days. Um, you know, because it is so critical in, in the larger scale, right, for large companies or more importantly, sure. large data infrastructures where they have thousands upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of CPUs in a single building to minimize not only the thermal envelope, but the electrical envelope, because there's a finite amount of electricity you can get to flow into a building. So the less power each individual CPU consumes, the more CPUs they can stuff into that building and the more work they can get done. So there's been huge advances made in the last five and ten years, certainly mostly in the last five, on minimizing the, the power and thermal footprint for a CPU. Um, you know, and, and when I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the pain from Ryan, I'm just going to say, like, you know, I, I, I get you wanting to save electricity, but 50 watts is nothing. Uh, especially if you, you know, if yep. you have a member, if you have somebody in the household with a hair dryer, if you use a microwave, <laughs> well, you, you laugh, right? But, you know, freaking microwaving true. a cup of coffee is blowing through like, you know, 600 watts for two minutes. You know, if you use a microwave, you want to save electricity, stop using a microwave. Um, <laughs> you know, if you want to save electricity, you know, is your refrigerator older than 10 years? Air dry your hair. Oh, my goodness. Uh, hair dryers are epic. Um, yeah. <laughs> I've seen people blow 20 amp circuits with three hair dryers but um 
poorly wired 20 amp circuits but but you know you're you're just because it's a thousand watt power supply doesn't mean it's actually drawing a thousand watts it draws enough power to feed the individual devices and unless i'm horribly mistaken your gpu is going to be drawing a minimal amount of wattage unless you're actually yeah. pouring on the coal during your favorite 3d frenzy the, the graphics cards, GPUs have gotten much, much better at idle power consumption over the last two or three generations. Um, I would recommend, you know, you can get a good card in the $200 range, and I don't think you're going to be wasting money there. And I would be surprised if that idles at anything more than 20 watts right. anyway, um, which in the grand scheme of things is, is close to nothing. I don't think we need to go in anymore. Patrick did a very good job of kind of summarizing that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's, it's No, no, it's, it's a... It, we want like, people to worry about these type of things on the uh, macro scale, and, and people always tell us, well, you can't really do that. You have to worry about it on the micro scale, and then it right. will turn into a macro, macro thing, but I can't. I mean, whatever. It's, it's just, it's, we, yeah, we, Andrew, it's a great question. Buy the most badass GPU you can afford, and trust me, when you're not using it, it's basically not going to be sipping much power. Exactly. Um, unless you're running some sort of folding application in the background, in which case, yeah, you, don't you, don't do Bitcoin <laughs> mining, and uh, you'll yeah. be fine, right? Because you know, yeah. it'll actually idle then. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and then you may notice that at the end of the month, looking at your electrical bill, trying to figure out where did this spike come from. <laughs> Uh, we got an email from Pete about upgrading uh, the notebook CPU and a success story. I believe we had a question about this last week. Mm -hmm. He says it's easier than you think. Recently upgraded Core Duo T2200 to a T9500. Upgrade was doable. Takes an hour of focus time and good organization of removed parts on the Inspiron. And Sony were easiest. Research to figure compatibility is the hardest part. Newegg sells latest mobile processors. Bought mine on eBay. I found a video on YouTube for the Dell Latitude motherboard swap that showed me everything I needed to know. Sony and 1525 had easy access to the processor that did not require a video once the back panels were removed. Upgrading to a newer generation uh, obviously is a motherboard change. No argument there. Counter argument is realized performance gain versus cost. Um, so... I, th this was in response to our last week's question and debate about would you even want to consider upgrading a processor on, on a mobile platform? And specifically, our question last week was about a tablet, which is, which is even different than, than just on an Inspiron notebook, right? An Inspiron notebook, you kind of have a little bit of working room. And this only is possible if they are using a socket. We, should, we, we need to reiterate that. Mm -hmm. And not, a lot of these, not all these processors are actually using removable socket, ZIF socket style designs, especially when you get into that tablet world and you get into CULV parts and atom-based parts and those types of things, you're all, very often seeing soldered on product. So mm -hmm. I, if, you, if you've got a notebook and you're interested in upgrading it, you can go on YouTube and you can go and, and read reports of people upgrading it. By all means, give it a shot. I am all about, and I know Patrick is all about, saving money where you can, upgrading, keeping components as long as possible. Uh, but I, I don't think we want to encourage people maybe that's not the right word we don't want to uh give people false hope right that you're going to be up you're going to be able to upgrade a notebook that you maybe buy next week yeah. it just i don't, just don't it's not a good thing to, to plan for this is this is awesome that he managed to do this but it is very much the exception for most people rather than the rule agreed Got an email I actually just got an interesting uh, comment in the twit uh the uh, twit live chat where uh, somebody was saying they they they're paying 24 cents a kilowatt hour in Jersey and 50 watts uh, against 8,760 hours, which would basically be a year, um, would add up to, ooh, actually, uh, I'm calculating as 105 bucks a year, not 50 bucks a year. But um, that would be considerably more expensive than A, electricity here in Northern California, and B, the mm. cost of my uh, freezer. <laughs> right. My, my big giant freaking freezer locker thingy. Kali's got a question about Core i3 Sandy Bridge versus high end Core 2. By the way, handymath.com is the source of a nice uh, calculator if you want to figure out what a mm. watt per hour, uh, what something's costing you if you have the watt value times the number of hours. Uh, for the past year or so, Kali says, I've been telling people to avoid the i3 when building or buying a budget system. 
I tell them that if they can afford it, go for an i5 or an i7, both great CPUs, but for basic budget computing, I have championed the Core 2 Extreme or Quad, promising a far higher performance for a lower price. However, with the arrival of the second gen i3s, I'm wondering if this is no longer good advice. In your infinite wisdom, would you guys <laughs> recommend... <laughs> yeah, this, there's something... I like that. <laughs> yeah, this is something I've not usually associated with. Uh, would you guys recommend that I still champion the top of the line of the Core 2 series, or has the, quote, new budget version i5 meaning the i3 surpassed it i like neutered budget version that sounds yeah. like a bad punk man <laughs> this is uh, an interesting question so he was basically saying uh, the original core i3s when they came out rather than getting those he was saying go with a core 2 quad mm -hmm. similarly priced i would I'm, I'm looking up a graph here i'm going to say that that's no longer the case right i'm going to look at the Core 2 Q9650 versus Core i3-2100. And even though it's a quad core versus a dual core, they are about even in terms of raw CPU performance looking at Sysoft Sandra results. Memory performance edge goes definitely to Sandy Bridge in that regard. Um, and then, and keep in mind, again, we're talking about a dual core versus a quad core there. Right. So that's actually pretty impressive differences there. And then just as a, as a last number check, we'll look at media encoding. Let's take a look at, say, uh, Handbrake, since we love that application so much. Um, pretty close to even on that. And that's with dual core versus quad core. So I, I think, yes, I think the time for you recommending core 2 anything over Sandy Bridge is, is probably gone. Well, right. over Core i3, because the, the new, the second gen Core i3 that he's talking about, he's referring to Sandy Bridge, uh, not uh, Clarkdale, is what the previous architecture was. It's also worth pointing out that the power consumption on the Core i3s, uh, you know, not to take anything away from our previous conversation, but the, the in terms of building a quieter system, uh, mm -hmm. if, if not in outright saving uh, money, the Core i3, I think, is going to do a better job uh, in terms of minimizing power consumption, per, especially compared to the Core 2 Extreme. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not by a huge amount, but certainly by a noticeable amount. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Uh, you know, our, our numbers show like a 50-watt difference at load. Yeah. Um, Which in Jersey at twenty four cents a kilowatt hour, <laughs> you're talking about one hundred and three bucks a year. Oh, <laughs> uh, see, we can use that argument from in our point of view. Either way, we go. We're just that good. Oh well, I think the trick is is if you if you don't want to spend the electricity, power the system down when you're not using it, or or you know basically it may cost you less over two years to to recycle an old you know low powered notebook uh, than it's going to cost you, or 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 uh, atom powered machine than it's going to cost you in electricity to run your high-end gaming machine right with that waffling on my part i'm gonna say <laughs> this is it for this week in computer hardware we want your question so email us twitch at twit.tv or you can find us on the twitter at ryan shrout at patrick norton no uh we do not at the moment have any google plus invites but when we do i'm sure we'll share them with you um what's no coming up on promises. Uh, no promises please don't take that as a reason to flood us with requests for <laughs> invites because um, I'm out. And, and when Google says I have more, I, I will let people know on the Twitter. What's coming up on PC Per this week, man? Uh, so after taking a look at our overclocking on Lano, we're going to spend a little bit more time on it. We kind of wanted to explore other avenues. We're going to take a look at dual graphics performance, see how that uh, kind of unfolds. We've already kind of complained a little bit about why doesn't work in DX9, but it does work in DX10 and 11. Still, we're going to evaluate maybe how effective that is. We're also going to test out the AMD Steady video technology. This Ooh. is a uh, GPU accelerated uh, image stabilization automatically. Like while you're watching a YouTube video, if you enable it, it will automatically stabilize shaky cam stuff. So we're going to take a look at that and see if that's even worthwhile. <laughs> and if those features maybe add to the value of Lano, because one of the debates we've had on the website and the staff recently is our su somewhat successful hardware leaderboard in our budget system. We are still listing the Core i3-2100 based system with a discrete Radeon graphics card as the budget system over Lano. And we need some reason, we need to see some proof that this is actually going to be a better product for our, uh, our readers and consumers in the long run. And so that's where we're making sure we touch all bases here to do that. So we've got a lot of that coming up. 
the graphics cards as well, some overclocked GTX 580s, two Ooh. of them actually, one from Gigabyte and one from ASUS as well. I like that thought. And uh, on Techzilla HD Nation? Uh, we've got uh, actually a couple of new Blu-ray players are up on HD Nation this week where we're looking at, uh, and actually it's amazing how fast the latest generation uh, of Blu-ray players are, not only to the first generation of Blu-ray players, which were really slow, but even the second, third generation uh, in terms of like how long it takes to load and launch a disc. Uh, and next week, if everything works out and we don't have horrible, horrible incidents, uh, we're finally going to test the bulletproof uh, hard drive, which is more accurately the ocean water diesel high impact being drugged behind the truck and abused in other horrible horrible ways uh, uh rugged portable drive from io safe so um it'll be interesting to see if it survives all of the horrible things because so far it's it's done really well actually uh, a little unnervingly well <laughs> So, uh, and I think I'm going to run it over with the truck last. I've, I've learned as a general yeah. rule, uh, the 7,000 pound truck test goes last. Uh, I have been polite. It has been suggested that while they have shot it with 12 gauges, that shooting it with a 308 is a very bad idea. Agreed. Um. <laughs> In general, I mean, I don't even know if we're talking about hardware. Everything, everything will go that way. Everything will go that way. That's it for this week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week on Twitch.